the question. It is now my pleasure to introduce tonight's guest. Morgan Jerkins is the New York Times bestselling author for her debut memoir, This Will Be My Undoing. She is the senior editor at Zora Magazine by Medium and a visiting assistant professor at Columbia University School of the Arts. We are here to celebrate her latest book, Wandering in Strange Lands, A Daughter of the Great Migration rec Reclaims Her Roots, which hits bookstores tomorrow. Moderate, moderating tonight's conversation is Karen Adia. She is the global opinions ed editor at the Washington Post and the 2019 N NABJ Journalist of the Year. And she also has a book coming out in March, 2021. Please welcome Morgan Jerkins and Karen Atia. Hey everyone. <laughs> I wish we had like intro music or something uh -oh. like that, right? Right. Um, yeah, so like, Morgan and I have been chatting. We there's a lot, a lot to get through. So again, I'll just jump right into things. But first of all, uh, politics and pros. Thank you so much for having me, Morgan. Thank you so much for having me. So again, I'm Karen Atia, and I am at uh, the Washington Post. And I jumped at the opportunity to be able to first of all get like a preview of your book, and second of all, I've followed you on Twitter for a long time. Your work at Zora, so this is a this is a privilege. Um, so I'll just like jump into it. I feel like we can just be like real and yeah. just you know, like one thing in terms of framing in this in this conversation. I mean, right now you, we have your book that you you began writing in 2018, if I if I remember correctly. Yeah. Mm -hmm. and, and now here we are in this sort of global moment of reckoning about blackness, about, about whiteness, about mm -hmm. who we are and who this country is and mm -hmm. our, our place in it. So for that framing, we have that and what's going on on the outside. And then like you and me, I mean, we didn't plan this like this whole thing right here, this whole red thing right here, but I would just right? Like, I would just say that, like, I'm speaking to you, you know, you are, I mean, in, in a lot of ways, reading this book, like, how sweeping it is, how your family's history, and not just your history, your curiosity took you from Georgia to Oklahoma, Louisiana, California, like, you really, in a lot of ways, told the American story. So you are a daughter, like, of, of this land, and I'm coming to this conversation as a daughter of West African immigrants. Mm -hmm. So when we get into some of the things that you discuss about basically what does it mean, do, do black people share, what is the connection that we share? Even if we haven't met, even if you know, there's the North South divide here in, in, the, U, in the US, um, but I'm coming to you as a different type of migrant or migrant background, yes. like another story of black movement and people on the move. So, with that said, I feel like this conversation is an interesting diasporic conversation as well. So uh, with that said, I'll just get right into it. Um, this one quote that you had uh, in, your, in, in your book like struck me as far as like one of your reasons for doing this book. And you wrote, you know, if I cannot pass down land, I can pass on words that will live on after I'm gone to remind other African-Americans that they too are much connected to the rest of us that they could ever imagine. So can you tell me, I mean, that's one, one way that you described why you were doing what you were doing, but tonight, like, tell us why you wrote this book. Yeah, so I wrote this book because I was born and raised in the North, particularly New Jersey. And I grew up in a home, in a community where conversations were very much stratified. Mm -hmm. I even mentioned in my book, like it was more than just grown folks conversation and children. It was like, my grandfather used to put like a toy mouse under my mother's like d bedroom door to make sure she wouldn't go out, the, go out the room and they're talking. And I get that certain things are too mature for children's ears, but also the consequences of that is that there's often omissions in what is being passed down. And so for the longest time, I, myself, or my mother, we didn't know where our grandfather was born and raised, why they even left. And it's so integral to our story because we're a part of the Great Migration, which, which I argue is one of the biggest cultural shifts in American history. The Great Migration is responsible for people like Toni Morrison, 
You know what I'm saying? It's responsible for, for, for all, so many different types of individuals. Um, and so for me, it was like so much of my life as an African-American woman had been characterized by loss, mm -hmm. whether it was being mindful of the transatlantic slave trade and how much was stripped of our identity to just how much was a uh, loss in our family with why we did the traditions that we did, why we believe the certain things we did. Um, and so I thought to myself, and I said this in my prologue, if my family has been on American soil for several generations, could it be that I could recover something by going backwards, literally, to the South and then across the country? I wanted to be able to fill in these gaps, not only for myself, but for other African Americans, those who have thought, felt that oral histories were a part of their, their family's lifeline for many generations, mm -hmm. and those who just had inquiries about their identity, who felt like the textbooks that they read in school or the documents that they found on the internet was just not enough. There wasn't enough pulse there. And so that's what, what definitely um, inspired me to write the book was just to go backwards and to just find out for myself. Mm. Mm. It's, it's interesting you say that. And again, like there's so much about this concept of, I mean, it, it's, it's literally like a Ghanaian term, this concept of Sankofa, right? Yep. With the image of the bird that's reaching back to mm. go back to the past to find out about like your presence, right? Mm -hmm. And it's it's like, again, there, there are things like in it that it's like, oh, I feel that, like we, we have something like that. So like with that said, like what you just said about trying your, your family and, and this is like very well captured in the book, just like how, how like fascinating your family members were and brave and, and I, I feel like your, your title even, this title, like wandering in strange lands. Like, can you explain that? Cause it, it seems like, I mean, in some ways you kind of had a map, right? And you yeah. did also like to add another layer to that. You encountered black people who knew that land, like knew the secrets and the blood that was spilled. Like, yeah. so was, I, I'm just curious about, about what, um, what went into that title about being strange. So um, the title was actually taken from a line of an Arna Bontemps a poem called Nocturne at Bethesda, where the, the poet writes about like, is there something that something precious that we have forgotten wandering in strange lands? Okay. And it was that part that I was like, oh, it, it, that kind of sums it up mm -hmm. for me. Like there's something that's lost and it's not my fault, but you know, can this curiosity lead me to some type of revelation? And so that's where Wandering in Strange Lands um, came from, was from a poem. Mm -hmm. But I think it also just sort of encapsulates that even though this is American, this is American in landscape, it's so big. Right. And th the way in which Blackness is gauged or assessed is different in, different in certain regions of the country. Mm -hmm. And so when I say water in strange lands, it's not only an ode to Arna Bontop, it's also just a reckoning for me to humble myself and to unlearn certain assumptions that I had about Black, Black American identity. And I want to emphasize Black American identity because I thought it was just one large, over, you know, encompassing this identifier. Mm -hmm. And it's not, it's Black American identities depending on where you are in the history. That doesn't mean we're all separate, but there are some distinctions that I really wanted to magnify um, through writing this book. Yeah, that, that, that makes sense. At first I thought you were gonna make a strange fruit reference. No, 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 at first, and then I was like, okay, that, like that, that makes sense. That make, again, it's just interesting because it's like, it's the, like the black enslaved peoples were were brought because in some cases they could work that land like yep. they they intimately and we'll we'll get into this in the next question but even like you know herbalisms and and roots and, and sort of black magic it's like black people still have this deep connection to to the land like yep. right Mm -hmm. Yeah, we worked it. I mean, we, I mean, we, our ancestors worked it. Mm -hmm. Our ancestors have intimate knowledge of it. It's dangers, it's sustenance, 
you know, the whole spectrum. So yeah, I guess it's like a double entendre, so to speak. So yeah. <laughs> no, like I the like the layers to your book are like like I think I need to read it again. Yeah. But just to like there's a lot that is there and, and yeah, it's a lot. But we only got 40 minutes. So <laughs> <laughs> all right. So so to even go go into this this question of assumptions, um you you the first like several portions of the book are about food first of all because you're like that's familiar when it comes to black food mm -hmm. and then uh you talk a bit about uh, about magic but i actually i want to talk about food and water for black okay food. i haven't eaten dinner yet so i'm gonna get a little hungry but <laughs> yeah. um talking about food so are you, so like why did i start with it or yeah just, it was just like oh, what you do first oh you, about you being black why? because i feel like the dinner table is the bridge across generations for black families mm -hmm. and i know that i can go to roscoe's chicken and waffles in california and get fried chicken and collard greens. I can go to Sylvia's on Harlem on 125th and Lennox and get the same thing. I can go probably down to Texas and well, Texas on another level in terms of its cuisine. <laughs> but I can go to Texas and get that. I can go to Mississippi Delta and get that. So well, I started with that because that's the biggest indicator that I had. I may not know so much about the folklore and the superstitions, but I know the food. And I know that I've traveled a lot before, even for, for leisure with my family. And we can get, and if it's a soul food restaurant, you can get that. So it's, it was a unifying force for me. But I remember in my book, there was something about a food tradition that, that stuck with me. Every New Year's Day, and I'm sure there's some Black people um, who are in this chat who can attest to this. You, you have collard greens for good luck. I got, excuse me, collard greens for money because it's green. And then you have like black eyed peas for good luck. And I asked my mom, I was like, why do we do this? I mean, it's good and delicious, but why do we do this? And she was like, it's just something that we do. And I'm like, no, that I, I'm a curious person. I'm a super Gemini for all you astrology people out there. I can't just take that. Mm -hmm. Something we just do. No, it's something that we've been conditioned to do. What What is the root of that? Mm -hmm. uh, pun intended. <laughs> and so when I researched the, when I researched about this tradition, I was directed to a recipe called Hoppin' John. And Hoppin' John originates from the low country, South Carolina. and originates from the Gullah Geechee people, which the Gullah Geechee people are the or one of the oldest, if not the oldest micro ethnic group of African Americans in this country. The Gullah Geechee people are also famous for being one of the few groups of African Americans in this country that has the highest retention rates of West African tradition. Mm -hmm. So I said to myself, I don't know anybody that's Gullah Geechee in my family. I've only heard of Gullah Geechee culture in two instances. One was Gullah Gullah Island, and two mm -hmm. was one of my friends has a grandmother, I think, who is of Gullah descent. But that's it. But I said to myself, okay, there has to be a connection. How do we get this recipe? So then I started researching some more, and I realized that it's it's been said, said by the International African American Museum, which is slated to open next year, um, that 80% of enslaved Africans that came to the colonies stepped foot on a Charleston dock, which is in South Carolina. So if that's the case, then we are all indebted. Most of us are indebted to Gullah Geechee people. So when I found that connection through the food ways, that's when I was like, I'm going to start with the low country then. That's where I'm going to go first. So the food, you, you literally like following the stomach first and yep. that helped to open up and inspire, you know, and, and and I'd love to come back to the kind of like the nuts and bolts of your process, but like I would love to know kind of from there. You talked about about food ways, and then like how how did you decide like what would take you to what place? Oh yeah, in, in the country. Oh yeah. So when I decided I wanted to go to the Sea Islands um, of Georgia and South Carolina, I knew that these communities, a lot of them were very vulnerable. A lot of the people that have been there have been displaced. Uh, property taxes were rising. In fact, on one of the sea islands that I talk about, Sapelo Island, property taxes had risen 500% in one year from the previous year. New York Times even reported on it. But I knew that before I traveled down there, I wanted to get in touch with people of the community first. 
to let them know this is who I am. This is proof that I have a contract, a book contract. to get to know me a couple months out before I go there. Mm -hmm. And when I spoke to one of the liaisons that I had in the low country, Georgia, her name is Tiffany Young. And I'm going to try to give shout outs to people and say their names um, because they were brave enough to open, you know, to open their lives for, you know, for me to, to you know, to investigate, but also because they did not want to obscure their names in the book. Mm -hmm. um, they didn't want pseudonyms. They wanted people to know them. So Tiffany Young, and when I spoke to her, I'll never forget, she told me that when I come down there, it's going to be like nothing I'd ever seen before. Mm -hmm. And she was right. Everything from the heat, everything from just the synchronicity, but also the unevenness of Black people's connection to land and water um, and the resources and, and the magic the palpability of that magic and just the feeling, you know, me being a young woman, I was in the low country. I was going down there, driving across the highways and the byways by myself. And I just felt protected. In fact, men, like, Tiffany, who was very spiritual, was like, part of the reason why I picked up your call is because I sensed that you needed to come down here. And mm. the rest is history, as they said. Mm -hmm. I, I want to come back to, to the challenges, maybe, of, of being a researcher and a, a Black woman on her own through the South um, in this. But to, to continue this, um, you know, no pun intended, this, this flow of, of from the foodways to the waterways, uh -huh. um, water occupies such a powerful place in your book. Mm -hmm. um, from, you know, the transatlantic passage itself to to a, a fear um of water we ask you know why don't black people swim you you right. have in your book the, the stats about um black people black children dying um from drowning at rates higher than than your peers and there's just so much so much about water um that i would love for you to talk about and, and the role that it plays for black people um in this country Sure. So what I'll say is the, the section that I have about water in my book, I was the hardest on myself on that section because I really wanted to nail it. I really wanted to go behind, beyond Black people don't swim because of the chlorine messes up our coils and stuff like that. My mother grew up in Atlantic City, which is a part of Absecan Island, which is near the water. If any of you have been in Atlantic City, it's right near the water. And she never learned how to swim. Her siblings never learned how to swim. My mother almost suffered a near fatal drowning accident. I've almost suffered a near fatal drowning accident. And I was born in Summers Point, which is also a part of the Jersey Shore. And I thought to myself, it's not just about our hair because the men make jokes too. And I talk about in the book, I use references. The people like Kevin Hart and the people like John Legend who talk about how treacherous the water can be. And I made the mistake when I went to the low country, before I went to low country, Georgia, I spoke to Tiffany Young and I started out with these assumptions. Black people don't swim, black people don't like the water. And she was like, no, that's not true. When you go to the low country, the water is in terms of, you know, if I'm going to quote um, Marquetta uh, Good, Goodwine, uh, who's known as Queen Quet. And she said, water is our bloodline. Mm -hmm. And it is, but the water encompasses so much of a spectrum for us. It's a form of nourishment, particularly in the low country with regards to the seafood, um, regards, regards to our burial practices. If you go to the low country, many of the cemeteries are facing the water because they believe that when you die, your soul will go back to Africa in the afterlife. I think about being a Christian where baptism, take me to the water or the river Jordan, it's, it's freedom, it's, it's cleansing. Mm -hmm. But if you think about the legacy of slavery, the transatlantic slave trade, we don't know how many people were thrown overboard because of disease and malnutrition, for example, or drowned. And so the Atlantic Ocean is also, and I quote, um, it, it's also like a floating graveyard of sorts. And so when I went to the low country, I noticed the dissonance while I was there. When you have these communities that the water was their bloodline, but if you go to Sapelo Island, the native islanders, the Gullah Geechee people, their water, their, their, their pipelines are full of lead. And it reminded me, oh, wait a minute, this is a national issue because if you look at Flint, Michigan, and you look at Newark, New Jersey, both black communities, the same thing is happening with our water. I thought about how there are untold amount of enslaved people 
whose bodies are floating in waters in the low country. I went there. I, I was taken to this place and I was not allowed to record it where Tiffany Young brought me to just like, these are where they are in dirty waters. You know, mm -hmm. these are where they are. And so for me, it was like, it's not just about the comedy about our hair and about the drowning. It's about the fact that as black people, the water can cons uh, consist of nourishment, as I said, and cleansing and healing and taking us back home in the afterlife, but it also constitutes fear, disappearance, disturbance, mm -hmm. poison. You know what I'm saying? I think about the the myth, or excuse me, I don't want to say, I don't want a myth to be a pejorative, but just the, the, the folklore around Igbo landing, where, mm -hmm. you know, these enslaved Africans were brought to Dunbar Creek in St. Simon's Island, which by the way, there is no public marker to commemorate this event, where they drowned rather than be enslaved. Tiffany right. Young is also the descendant of people that worked on St. Simon's Island. This was a story that they passed around. Um, I'm thinking, you know, just also about segregated pools in the north, where it wasn't just a matter of like, we didn't want to swim, we also didn't have the choice. Because right. before black people started migrating to the north, white people, there were there were separations between rich white people and poor white people. But when black people started migrating in droves, they're like, okay, we got to band together and be white, white, right. to sort of prevent this, this mobility of black people in our spaces. So it's about segregation. It's about systemic racism, but it's about this continual just amputation of our relationship with the water. And, and you can see this in pop culture. Beyonce, Lemonade, you see that when she goes into Lake Pochatron and it's really healing for her. You see it in um, Daughter, uh, Daughters of uh, the Dust, um, which talks about Gullah Geechee culture in the water. You see it in um, also, uh, what's that movie called? Atlantic's. Mm -hmm. where it's based in Senegal, where it's talking right. about the water and being taken away. So water is just, it is a transformative and also a treacherous element mm -hmm. of African-American life. And I'll just say of the diaspora period, actually. Yeah, it's it's interesting because I feel like, I feel like water is the, the point of like such a break in some ways, like between Africans and African-Americans. Because even when you mentioned Igbo Landing, and when you read about it in the book, I remember underlining it just because, you know, the Igbo are a tribe in Nigeria, but the Yoruba is a separate tribe in Nigeria, actually worship goddesses, spirits, mm -hmm. Jemaya uh, of the sea, of, of motherhood and, and fertility, um, um, Oshun, we see lots of pop culture references, Beyonce, as you said, um, Oshun, who wears yellow and gold and is the goddess, or goddess is not exactly the, but the Orisha of mm -hmm. sweet water, so of lakes, of rivers. And so for, for the Yorba, like water is a, is a female, is a healing thing, represents aspects of, uh, of, of power that can be transferred, particularly to women. So in the uh, U.S., to have this, to have this fear, to have water represent death. I, even as I was reading, I was thinking, um, we don't even talk about, uh, uh, or I was just thinking about like um, hoses, water hoses being used on civil rights protests. Yeah. Right? It's, yes. It's, yes. It's the, the water is a weapon what? when it comes to black, black Americans. When in, in, in the original intent, was that the water, and again, particularly Black women, we were, we were one. It was a burst. It was of, of um, playfulness. Even the uh, Oya, who's of storms and of rain, yep. is one of justice, right? And so, like, to me, that's one of the most sad losses uh, right. of the negative um, weaponizing, in some ways, of water um, uh, against us and becoming becoming um, our graves. Uh, so, like to me, like I said, I was like I was reading that. I was like, oh, the levels, like the levels. I'm Do so you know how to swim now, though? Can What's you swim that? now? Can you swim I've, now? I've always been able to swim, but okay. I've gone ten years without swimming. Okay. I, last time I swam or swam uh, was <laughs> in 2018. I went to Mexico. And I was in this huge cenote, which is a sinkhole, which I don't even know why I thought about doing it, but I had a life jacket on, but you don't know the depths of it. You don't mm -hmm. know how, how far it goes. And prior to that time, it had been 10 years since I'd been in the water. 
Um, and so, yeah, I think about water very differently now based on what I, I've seen, particularly in the low country. I will say that it just, it changed my life, for yeah. lack of a better phrase. Yeah. So I wanted to move on because you mentioned, you mentioned your mother and um, there's a part, I believe it's on uh, page 76, where you mentioned how your mom has a fear of cats. Yeah. Can you talk about, about why she has a fear in cats and just this, this uh, element of fear that I guess is, is in your bloodline and yeah. whether or not you think trauma, way, and I don't mean to make this whole conversation about trauma or anything, but just like, I wanted to know a little bit more about the cat story and, and right. but like whether you had inherited that as well. Yeah. Um, my mom is probably going to hate me for talking about it, but <laughs> I didn't, I don't like cats like that. Um, if, if you don't, if you follow me on Twitter, you know, I make a lot of jokes about cats. Um, uh, I don't think they're really nice. I, sometimes I know they are friendly, but the reason why I have such a contested issue about cats is what happened to my mother. Mm. My mother, um, she grew up in the projects in Atlantic City and, at the time in South Jersey, there were a lot of racial covenants, basically saying like these white people band together and be like don't allow white people to move into these neighborhoods. Um, and they moved into a suburb in Pomona, which is about which is you know not too far from Lang City. They were the second black family on the block. And when they moved there, KKK burned crosses in their backyard, and white children would throw mangled cats on my mother and her siblings. Mm -hmm. And ever since then, my mother has had an aversion to cats. She won't talk about it to people. She'll say that, you know, I'm allergic because she doesn't want to offend people. But I personally am like, let people know because that is, a, that's a harassment and that's assault and that's trauma. And people need to know about the lengths that white people, even white children will do when they don't want you in their spaces. So it's been a hard thing to disentangle because, you know, I live in New York and, you know, writers, they love their cats. Also, <laughs> they, they ward off mice. Mm -hmm. But it's like a part of the reason why I have that aversion is because I think about how they were used to, to terrify the crap out of my mother. Mm. You know what I'm saying? And my mother was a kid at the time. My, my grandfather had to drive them to the bus stop because he was afraid of leaving them there by the believing my mom and her siblings there by themselves imagine being that young you see the kkk burn cross in your in your backyard you have white children throwing mangled cats on you you have to have your father drive you to the bus stop and mm -hmm. it's interesting now that i'm talking about it because when my when i lived in another suburb in south jersey it was a Harper township the bus stop was literally adjacent from my house mm -hmm. uh, but my mother would drive me to the bus stop and I used to think she was just doing it because she wanted more time with me. I'm very, very close to my mother, you know? But a part of me now wonders if she did that because she didn't want white people harassing me. Like I've done it, just talking about it now makes me think of like the cyclical motion mm -hmm. of ways in which we're surveilled and the ways in which black parents try to protect their children in white dominated neighborhoods. Yeah, now nah, I mean, now you should go back and ask her because it's it's just you just think about it and there's been research about how these stress responses are passed down like right. DNA. Right, right, absolutely. Yeah. So I mean, from there, uh, and you mentioned her earlier in, in your talk, um, but Tiffany, the, the tour guide, unofficial tour guide Tiffany, um, who you meet and who is showing you around uh, um, in Georgia. And she has, there's a particular uh, moment or, or instance in the book where uh, you're talking about trying to put up a historical marker for her to be able to tell uh, about her family, her family's story and what happened to them. Um, and again, like you wrote this before this whole moment we're in nationally with like monuments and, and markers and and taken down Confederate history and, and what to do with, can you talk a bit about like that exchange and sort of um, in some ways the resistance of the state okay. to black people trying to, black women <laughs> trying to actively tell their story? Yeah, all right, let me let me see if I can get this right. I don't know where to start. Well, so there's, 
Yes, yes. Like, where do I start? Um, Tiffany Young, first off, is the descendants of enslaved Black people were sold a part of the was a part of the weeping time mm -hmm. weeping time is the largest recorded slave auction in history 436 men women and children were sold that day and it was and it was over the course of two days and it is said that the cries were so loud that the volume uh competed with that of the torrential downpour that was happening thus the name she's the descendants of those who worked who toiled on plantations in st simon's island and also Butler Island, which is where I went to. Butler Island Plantation is a rice plantation in McIntosh County, Georgia, not too far from Darien, where I was staying. And Butler Island Plantation is famous because a writer named Fanny Kimball went there to write about the just the horrific nature of the ways enslaved Black people being treated, just, just the whole conditions. The slave mortality rates, adult and child, were just incredible. In fact, when I was doing the rest, I had to make sure I had to stop before the sun went down because I didn't want it on my spirit. When mm -hmm. I went there with her, the historical marker says, you know, talks about the engineers, talks about the rice, talks about Fanny Kimball and the way that she went here to document her travels. It says nothing about the enslaved Africans who risked their lives to build these levees and dikes with the crocodiles right there. And it doesn't talk about the amount of people that died to work this land, the conditions that they had to work under. In fact, there are some scholars who argue that the rice plantations in the low country rivaled the brutality of the sugar plantations in Haiti mm. um, and, and, and Louisiana. And so when I, when, I, when I went down there, she had a whole folder. She was ready with coordinates and maps and correspondence and she told me I have been trying to get an historical marker to honor my family for years I researched an historical marker thousands of dollars you can't have any adulatory language in historical marker but if you research right now go on the Butler Island Plantation look at the historical marker it praises it gives a compliment to Fanny Kimball so I said okay so what does adulatory mean then mm -hmm. because right now this can argue the way you're praising her and, and what she did that's adulatory and so for me, like, again, I did not foresee this moment. I did not foresee this moment where Confederate monuments and monuments to slave traders will be torn down, be defaced, be thrown into the water. I didn't expect that. But what I think, what I wanted to get across to people is that part of the reason why we have these ruptures in African-American memory, just mer and memory in general, and the ways in which the lives of Black people and the formerly enslaved are devalued as a whole in textbooks and in mainstream discourse, is one of the ways is the lack of public acknowledgement, the lack of public acknowledgement, the lack of historical markers, the lack of context to whose lives and bodies were sacrificed for the wealth and the grandeur of these plantations. And, and that's what happened when I went there. There was nothing, there was nothing that, 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 that talked about the people that, 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 you know, laid down their lives involuntarily for this plantation. What it did was talk about the, the white woman that documented it. Right. I mean, it just, it adds a whole nother layer to even the title of the book, Strange Lands. We don't know because there's a lack of markers. There's a lack of physical, like, sort of notation right. in, in the text of the land right. about, like, this what this happened here, this person was here. Right, right. And that yeah. really gets to the, 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 the separation between documented truth and, and truth that you get from non-institutions, right? Because if you want to mm. just go from institutions and what they put out well a lot of these institutions are white dominated they're not all all full of black and brown people so the narratives are not in our power to begin with but you so you so there is this there is this divide between oral history and what and documentation and the problem with that is that a lot of times we talk to people they're like where is your proof Mm -hmm. Where in the paper? Where can I see? And it's like, so wait, so what about the veracity of Black people's oral storytelling that has helped with their survival for generations? That that can't be held as, as veritable either? Why right. not? Right. That is, that, exactly, exactly. You do a great job in your book balancing both. Like, you come with the receipts, obviously, like, where necessary. Mm -hmm. But it's like, it's so true. I mean, and that is part of the challenge of being a black storyteller mm -hmm. is 
the sort of gaslighting, as, as we talked about before, the gaslighting that is done to you, and then sometimes like the gaslighting that is that you do to yourself. And I just wanted to say, like, we haven't even scratched the surface of the depth of your book. Like, we've just talked about the very like broad like themes and these themes of the characters that you're meeting along the way who are like trying to do their part to tell the story, and you're telling that story. I mean, geographically, you know, when you when you head to Louisiana, and that chapter is about like the Creole uh, uh, question and the relationship of, of Louisiana, the special, the ex Louisiana ex exceptionalism, maybe I would call it in some ways in like the black American story and the, the popular culture about black America is this sort uh -huh. of, um, I don't know, this the, the grand story of Louisiana and the people who are from there. And then when you go to Oklahoma, that's about the encounter with Native Americans and this question of like the mix of of Native Americans and what that means to sort of complicate ideas of race okay. and race relations. And then, um, I mean, it, it's a lot, but you, you end with Los Angeles, right? And like this idea of, of movement of Black people being confined to like ghettos and, and projects. And so this like idea of, of movement and then confinement, like movement and then like confinement. So all that's in the book and everybody, all 109 of y'all better go like read it. But I, I want to get into like, this question of like how how you did this and stayed sane, um, how you did this and was able to, again, like you said, um, just, I just wonder if like there were certain things that you encountered that like you just, you couldn't even believe that it happened or, or that it was true. Like we talked earlier and you said there was moments when you were gaslighting yourself, yeah. even what you encountered. Can you talk about that? When I, I actually did an interview with um, Layla Fidel of, of Fidel of uh, NPR Weekend Edition, and I spoke about, about the Butler Island Plantation. I spoke about the lack of an historical marker for the enslaved Africans that toiled there. And when I finished the interview, I was like, did I really see that though? It couldn't have been that bad. Let me go to the website, just make sure. Cause I was, there was something in the back of my mind. I was like, somebody's gonna say, you're lying. There's a marker there, I see it. And I was like, but no, I got pictures. I went there with someone who's a descendant of the enslaved that, that worked there. She told me, I, I got recording. So why am I gaslighting himself? It's because it's hard to be believed mm. as a black person, especially as a black woman, especially mm. doing this kind of work. Um, right. and, and so that's why I, I was gaslighting myself. And I'll be honest with you. Mm. There were many times where I thought this book was not gonna come together. Whether Why is that? What kind of, what's your that? Oh, just, I mean, like, again, like the scope of it all, but I'm just like thinking about, I mean, writing a book is hard and I'm kind of doing it like, but like what you're doing requires a certain rigor and a certain X, like, I, it's I, a lot. <laughs> you know, what's interesting, like I'm sitting in my office right now and I'm still looking at like the little sticky notes that I made. Um, this storm, oh, I haven't taken them down for a reason. Um, there were many nights where I cried mm -hmm. and I'm getting emotional just thinking about it. I cried because I thought my book deal was going to get canceled. Why? Why because would it? I just, I, it wasn't coming together. I was like, I can't find my ancestors. It feels like they're mm -hmm. hiding from me. Like, what, what were the trips? Like what, like describe like what a roadblock would look like in this process. Roadblock is like, for example, trying to find an ancestor and they say that they they were together, but I can't find a marriage license. Mm -hmm. Trying to find an ancestor, but I can't find my my grandmother. You know, five times over, I can't find her last name. I can't. You know what I'm saying? Um, trying to find an ancestor, but the documents that I come up with, there there's a lot of misspellings. Um, mm -hmm. the, the the documents are very much like um, what's the word? kind of they're not always like you ever print out a paper and you realize it's not it's like gray and it's kind of feels like right. different gradients of gray and it's not coming right. things like that or you know just it was just hard because it was like it was taxing mm -hmm. because you realize like how much we have been devastated but like you were you on your own doing this like you didn't have help Oh, wait a minute. Well, so I will say like, well, in terms of traveling, when I went to the low country in Georgia, I was driving around by myself. 
When mm -hmm. I was in Louisiana, I had help from a scholar. Um, his name is Antoine Hardy. And he was actually helping like take videos and all that. When I went to California, I was with a, a underground rapper. His name was James <laughs> um, right. McCall. And he was sh showing me around, talking to people who witnessed either the 1965 mm -hmm. Wyatt's Watts uprising or the 1992 uprising or both of them so i had people but there were a lot of times while i was alone especially mm -hmm. in oklahoma and i was like even to this day i'm like how in the hell did i do all of that did you feel, I safe? Huh? Did you feel safe all the time traveling by yourself no, in some no, i'm from no. texas i'm in texas and there's some places where mm -mm. oh let me tell you something, and I and I tweet about this, you know, because I'm promoting the book, and I won't say it on Twitter because I'm afraid they're gonna take me off. But there were certain parts of the country, and I'm gonna say specifically Oklahoma, where I felt like if I were gonna do it again, I would have a gun. Wow. And the reason why I say that is because, unbeknownst to me, I was driving past sundown towns. Mm. When you go to Oklahoma, I was doing work on the five civilized tribes, particularly the freedmen and Black Americans. When you go to Oak certain territories, Oklahoma, you don't know if you're not only have to deal with the Oklahoma police, but you also have to mm. deal with the white horsemen, which is the police department of the five civilized tribes. I was mm. dealing with people whose family members were murdered or disappeared from because of their land allotments. I've been dealing with people who've been threatened to be lynched because of the activism that they had been doing for freedmen, people of African descent in the five civilized tribes. I'm from the New Jersey. I, they could look at me and tell that I wasn't from there. So, yeah. so most days I was driving around with nothing but a recorder, my cell phone, my purse, and a prayer. That's mm -hmm. it. I treated myself as I was a high school student. I always made sure that I could just race to beat the sun as it set um, in the West. I made sure that as soon as I got to my hotel and got into the room, and not a moment sooner, I transferred all my files and transferred them to the transcriptionist I hired and also let somebody know that I was in. Mm -hmm. But there were many times where I thought about where I was in the low country in South Carolina or I was in Oklahoma where I was like, you could have got hurt. You could have, you could have got hurt. And I, I think about how, you know, for example, gas stations, I'm from New Jersey. We don't pump our gas. That's true. And I remember when I was meeting with a multiracial man of a Creek citizen who fought for freedmen's rights, I had to get gas. I drove all 90 minutes to go see him from Oklahoma City to Tulsa. And I asked him, can you please come with me? The sun was already beginning to set. I didn't know what gas station to go to. I mean, if you think about the Green Book, the Negro Motorist right, Green exactly. Book, they let you know, you know what I'm saying? Like where to stop. I didn't know where to stop. So I was like, let him stay with me. And as soon as I, Got a full full tank. I I put the pedal to the metal. I I raced to mm -hmm. get back to my hotel before it, it was dusk, so that I can be inside. Yeah, I mean, I think that's that's the thing about being black in America. It's like you don't people know. are like, you know, people are like, I, you know, I've been a foreign correspondent in in hostile territory and like you know tough locations. I'm like. Like being black and even walking in a park is like no, no, no. right, no, no. and so for you to be to be asking, also you're asking some difficult questions. You're stirring stuff up, as we we like to say, you know, from the past that's traumatic. That like I, I can imagine it must have been really scary. So I feel like, can you believe like we're almost we are like, we haven't even scratched the surface, but it's like, there's a lot of like interesting questions and comments that I, I do want to get to. Um, there's so much, so much that I want to ask, but I have a question, which is also probably like, it's kind of like, uh, I don't know if you've ever seen the um, Instagram lives by Z-Way, where she like <laughs> interviewed, where she like <laughs> interviewed, you know, poor unsuspecting, uh, you know celebrity white women about like race stuff but i have a question for you in that spirit like so is this book for white people should they read this who is this for oh i mean what do you feel so, about they're not censored but so here's the thing like for me like i it's weird because i say it's for everybody because mm. you know i think there's something there for everybody but if you have white people that are wondering why the protests keep happening again. Why is the cyclical nature of black rage and white backlash to black progress happening? 
read this book. If mm. you're a white person that was interested in, in, you know, the legacy of slavery, whether it was through your own personal findings or the 1619 Project or any other type of literature that you perused, this is the book for you. If you're a black person who has had questions about your identity and also the migratory trajectories of your people, this book is for you. If you are a black person who has thought, you know, I'm not sure if my grandmother was lying about X, Y, and Z. This book is for you. If you are an American mm. who is trying to see the failures of the public school system with the textbooks and what they tell to us and how that affects us per people personally and intimately, read this book. If you have any interest <laughs> in what it's like to delve into family history and now that connects with displacement, systemic violence, land theft, land loss, but also renewal and migration and movement and resilience, resilience, this book is for you. I love it. We didn't even practice for that, but like she killed it. That was great. Like, uh, so, so one last question that I'm asking to you as somewhat a fellow black woman in the media, mm -hmm. um, as you have just done a book that is about you know, so much about the, the Black experience. Yeah, I mean, I know you said in the beginning that there is no one quite like monolith, mm -hmm. but this is the, a large framework for mm -hmm. a foundational aspect of Black people's experience in, in this country. Um, mm -hmm. So I'm curious about what you think about all the brouhaha over capitalizing being Black Oh, and capitalizing the W in white because there's a lot of there's a lot of big D discourse. Yeah, <laughs> well, you know what? Can I say something? I'm gonna say this. Do what you want. <laughs> it's like if you, I am not offended. People have feelings. People have feelings. They like do. All, what they all, do. All sort of they do. And my thing is, it's like if I say black, if I'm writing to you, I'm texting you, and I say black. Mm -hmm. Or you texting me, you say black and you under and you lowercase. I don't care. You know, because it's like it's not a disrespect to me if a white okay. person did it. Like I would care if like you capitalize white, but you don't capitalize black. But I think it's hard for me because on the one hand, like I'm thinking internet speak and I'm thinking about colloquial ways, and I'm like just up, the lowercase uppercase. I don't care. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> I also think about like. A lot of people say like whiteness is a construct, right? Mm -hmm. You know what I'm saying? It it, it, it it sort of solidifies it like supremacist attitude, which I, I think that that's a really poignant point. But I also think about with regards to blackness, the ways in which we esteem blackness, engage blackness isn't always the same, especially right. not in this country and especially not, you know, in the world, mm -hmm. you know, we might be black here. We might be considered something elsewhere, but right. that's not, and but that's the thing it's like, I'm all for, for white dominated institutions capitalizing black if it is going to empower their audience, if it's gonna bring more black people in and it's gonna command a certain type of respect. Mm -hmm. um, I'm more looking about, I'm more looking at the contextualizations. If you're gonna capitalize black, are you hiring more black and brown people? Mm -hmm. Are you breathing more life into our stories? It's not just about the, the capitalization what is the actual story that you're promoting on top of that? Mm -hmm. I think if you give me that fullness, I'm all for it. But if it's just a matter of capitalizing low or lowercase, and it's like that, that's light work for me. Like, the, like what else, you know, what else is there? You know, like there, there has to be more there. Nah, that makes sense. I mean, it, it's something that I've heard across the spectrum from, from black and white people. When I was reading your book um, or finishing it up with this whole, you know, part of the, I don't know, grammatical reparation. I don't know like what you call <laughs> like, <laughs> like you, know, <laughs> you know, spell check reparation. I, you know, I, look my but like having written something that's come out in this moment about the interrogation of black people as an ethnic group. And I think, you know, for me, like the the story that you've written in many ways when it comes to the food, when it comes to the culture, like people who are like me or like my parents, it's almost like they come to this country and eventually like we will be assimilating into black 
culture, like blackness in a way, like okay. once, once, you know, and depending on our personal choices, like once my kids or grandkids, like here is their home, right? And yeah. so that connection could be lost to, to Ghana or, or Nigeria. So I think about that a lot, like as I was reading and um, as you're talking about just like all the things that are very much black America, it's like in the future generations, we're gonna be talking about kids who are assimilating in some ways into big B black. Like, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. so it's it's fascinating. All right, uh, moderators, I know we're, we have a couple of questions here that I will get through. Um, I have this question about, let's see, what was like one, of the most joyous or spiritual moments that you had during your journey? All right. So one jo joyous moment that I had a spiritual moment was, so when I, when I take pictures a lot, I smile really broadly and you can't really see my eyes. Um, and my mom always just tell me, open your eyes. And I'm like, they are open, but they're not. And it's one of the biggest traits that I get from my father. Prior to my journey, my father was a little bit of an enigma to me. I didn't really know much about his side. I didn't definitely didn't know that he was Creole. Um, I didn't know any Creole living in New, Creole people living in New Jersey, so it was very foreign to me. And when I started doing, when I was about to embark upon my journey in Louisiana, I had a woman. Um, her name was Tracy Colson Anti, um, and she told me that you might be surprised when you get down there. These people will probably look at your face and guess where which parish your ancestors are from and i'm like no nah, that, that's not gonna happen to me because i'm several generations removed went down there to lafayette and i went to this festival and somebody said to me are you from saint landry parish which saint landry parish is not too far from where my ancestors are from saint martin parish and i was like oh i'm from here and i'm like oh okay and then one of the other people that was with us her name is i'm kelly clayton a creole poet and she said to me it's because of those half moon eyes it was the first time that someone characterized my eyes in that way. And I knew that it had to be because I went backwards. It was because mm. I went down to Louisiana and I was recognized, even though my own mm. father's never even been to St. Martin Parish before. I don't think any of his siblings had either. So to go down there and to be recognized immediately and to give, and to give me pride in these, the way that my eyes change depending on when I'm happy um, that was a really joyous moment for me. Oh, I love, I love, like when you're, you're seen, like, right? Like that yep. moment of connection, especially like, again, especially as a black woman, when you feel invisible so often in this country, like, um, yep. I think that's powerful. So another question from Melissa. So did you finally find the ancestors that you talked about, the ones that you encountered roadblocks? I did. And this is where timing works because my book was not coming together. I had to do draft after draft after draft. And then literally it was a year later in 2019 where I found the ancestor that I was looking for. So I was like, I guess timing worked out that way, but it took a lot. It was, it was a, it was a thorn in my side. It was pissing me off. Everything else seemed to be coming together except that. Okay. Okay. Um, another question from, let's see. Brandon, um, we know you like your book is coming out tomorrow, but people are already like, so has this uh, experience influenced what you'd like your next writing project to be? It did. Um, well, my next book is a, is, is a, no it's a novel and it's called Call Baby. Um, and it's actually coming out next year. What? How do you yeah. have the time? <laughs> Making all of us look that okay, okay, keep going. Not next year. And what it is in in in, in, in African American folklore, it is said that if you're born with a veil, you have a gift, whether it's second sight, seeing in the past, the future, or healing. And um, my one of my aunts is said to be born with a veil. She's very perceptive about people. And it was funny because when I was researching root work and root doctors um, in the low country, South Carolina, one of the biggest, if not the biggest, root doctor down there, not Dr. Buzzard, was said to be born with a call. It said to be born with a veil. So that actually um, inspired me. And also the way that I developed these characters and their migratory paths from the South to Harlem, I definitely took from my field work um, doing this book. Okay. Um, let me, let, maybe the one question, and then I'm not sure, moderators, if you're keeping time for me, if I'm just like going with it, but. You're great on they, time, Karen. Oh, sorry? So sorry, you're great on time. Okay, cool. They say I'm great on time. All right. 
Um, the Brandon um, also is asking, and all the um, participants, uh, feel free to use the Q and I'm sure there's so much like to ask uh, to ask Morgan. But um, he asked, "What is the most surprising fact you discovered in tracing your genealogy?" Oh man, I don't want to give it away. Oh, but, but I, I, I get but, most well, surprising. I know one of the things for my ancestor in Louisiana, um, one of the most surprising facts that I learned was that um, it was said that one of my earliest ancestors, Matarin Regis or Matarhan Regis, mm -hmm. uh, he came to Louisiana, married a Louisiana Creole woman, and but he was from Virginia. And I actually have an older cousin, he passed away a long time ago. He has, a, has an autobiography called Up From The Cane Breaks. And he writes about Matarin and he says, he was from Virginia, but maybe he, but that name isn't common in Virginia. So maybe he took on a name after he was manumitted, which means freed from slavery in the Canaan, Louisiana. Somehow I looked up his name because if you go on ancestry.com, there's, um, there was, um, this sort of resource with the, with, in conjunction with the, the, uh, UCL, the University College of London, where it talk, where it has these slave records from British people. I looked up his name and I found his name on a slave register in St. Lucia. St. Lucia was also a French colony at one point. His name was Matter. He was eight months old, I think. His sister Matarine was three and his mother Angelique was 31. And I thought to myself, I was like, I did the math on the, on the dates and I was like, that's my grandfather. And I said, so maybe some, and I found out the, the man who owned him also had property in Virginia. So mm -hmm. I said, maybe he was taken as a child to Virginia and he doesn't remember. And that's where we got this idea that it started in Virginia. It didn't start in Virginia. It started from another French colony and it was St. Lucia. And I don't know whatever happened to Matarine. I don't mm -hmm. know whatever happened to Angelique, but I realized like, no, he didn't take that name. He was, he was from St. Lucia. Mm -hmm. That sort of, sort of leads into, into the last question that's in the chat. Um, just again, like what, what resources, genealogy, chronology resources did you use to, to inform your work? Yup, census records. This is why census records are so important. I don't know if any of y'all have been on Twitter and like, please sign it, please sign it. Mm -hmm. Census records are important because they let you know not only when someone was born, if you look at their age and you look at the when the census record was, uh, was released, you can do the, the dates but also let you know who else is in the household too. And then also what were their occupations? What was the location of where they are? So census records are important. You can find that on ancestry.com. You can also go to archives.com if you need a little bit more help with the resources. Um, for black people, I would say to reach out to the African-American Genealogical Society or Afro-American Genealogical Society. They have different chapters throughout the country. You can reach out to them as well. Um, and also your resource is your elders. Mm -hmm. Talk to the oldest people in the family. Ask them where they lived when they were younger, what type of community it was. What were their parents' names? Where did they come from? Maybe their birthdays or what are your elders' birthdays? Anything that can tie you to a place or just a, a name or a last name. Even if it's questionable with regards to lineages, all you need is that and a little bit of curiosity and you're on your way. Nice. For all the budding, like maybe historians who might be influenced to like look up their own stories as well. So thank you for that. Um, moderators, are y'all, is it time? Are we good? Oh, are we good? Oh, yes. Um, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Politics um, so it is eight o'clock now. Um, I want to thank. Oh, sorry, breaking up a little bit. <laughs> You're good, Morgan. Oh, okay. Well, I wanted to quickly say, I mean, I, there's so much like that All we can right. get to, but again, thank you guys so much, Morgan. Like, thank you for having, uh, for inviting me to do this. And thank you for doing this, this. Thank you for doing this, like. Um, as a black woman, like we all, we all owe you for that work. Um, you. that you've done and so thank you thank you thank you so much thank you all for coming um i hope it was as wonderful for you as it was for me um and it's just been a pleasure thank you so much
Yep. I would uh, like to thank the both of you, more Karen, for uh, being here on the behalf of Politics and Pros. Thanks for hosting an event, having an event with us. And uh, everyone who's still here in the chat, please pick up Morgan Jerkins' new book, Wandering in Strange Lands. It's out tomorrow. And we still have a $5 shipping rate on our website. All right. And thanks, everybody, for being here. Thank you. Thank you, guys. Thank you.